Grandma was refusing to die. I was 6 years old when she turned 98, and I'm about to turn 21. I really did think she was going to hit the 120 years old milestone. That was until I received the call that she had fallen down the stairs. According to mom, Grammy wasn't dead, but it's not like she was doing well, stuck on her chair and barely eating. Mom invited us to a farewell dinner where all of her close friends and family would be in attendance. Grandma wanted to see her grandchildren one last time, and who are we the ones to deny her last wish? Well, here's the thing. The night of grandma's dinner party was also a full moon. Presently, I was power walking down a trail that was supposed to be a shortcut, straight through the woods, which would lead us to grandma's house. But it was getting darker, and the darker it was getting, the more danger we were in. I was slowly regretting my decision to wear a formal dress and heels. Jem was in front of me. Unlike me, my brother chose to wear Converse with with his suit, both annoyingly stylish and suitable for the terrain. It was only the third time he'd poked fun at my outfit. Mom was worse. Since I started college, she'd grown obsessed with my weight, demanding I eat more. Your skin and bones, Hannah. She regularly reminded me via video call. You need to bulk up. But I was a normal weight. Lena and Jem were the exact same, so why was I the one being grilled? Coming to a halt, my brother bent down. Jem poked the dirt. Cake crumbs, he nodded to the trail. Who brings a cake into the woods? Kids, maybe. I was trying not to be passive aggressive. I still wasn't talking to him. Of course, you have an explanation for everything. Just keep going, I said, tipping my head back and studying the sky. It wasn't dark yet, but that didn't mean we were in the clear. The sun was setting, a chill creeping its way down my spine. Keep your head down, eyes on the ground. Jem straightened up, running his hands through shoddy hair. While I was a mousy blonde, Jem and Lena were redheads. Does that stick up your ass hurt? Instead of responding in full, I kicked his feet. Ow. Walk. I don't even want to go to grandma's, Jem grumbled. Grandma's dying. He shot me a look, most likely an eye roll behind tinted Ray-Bans. Grammy's been dying since we were in diapers. Walk faster. I am. He gritted out. Where's Lena? She flew in early a few days ago, I said. You would know that if you actually looked at the group chat. Jem folded his arm stubbornly and I glimpsed his tattoo sleeve under the cuff of his jacket. I told you to cover that up. Mom will have an aneurysm. Ignoring me, my brother followed the trail of cake crumbs, dancing over each one, and miraculously, our surroundings started to bleed into familiarity. Grammy's house was just ahead of us. Jem, quickening my pace, I tripped over a branch. What? Hide the tattoo. Mom will murder you. As usual, Jem wasn't taking anything fucking seriously. Relax. I'll just wear my jacket all night. Mom's not stupid. He let out a bitter laugh. Well, if I play the truth game tonight, I'm pretty sure I'm going to show her anyway. Jem's words twisted my gut, and I was suddenly far too aware of the darkening sky. Infamously, at least in our family, the Bolivia siblings are not exactly compatible with the full moon. I don't know when it started. It could have been from the moment we were born. For whatever reason, the full moon sends us a little crazy. I don't think it was that noticeable when we were little kids, though I do vaguely remember being six or seven years old, standing knee deep in the swimming pool. According to mom, I was sleepwalking, but I remember being fully awake, staring up at the sky, a hypnotizing light bathing my face, the shallows enveloping me. I remember the light being so bright, my breath pulled from my lungs. I don't know how long I stood there. The world didn't seem real, and time flowed slowly like nothing mattered except the sky and the moon, and my enraptured thoughts. I don't remember feeling the wetness of the water, or even my fingers lightly trailing across the surface. All sound dulled to the lulling murmur of the ocean. In my mind, centuries had gone by with me frozen by that light and I was okay with sinking into her oblivion. In reality, it had been 15 minutes. 15 minutes, and I felt otherworldly, my body and mind detached. 
the air felt tangible, like I could reach out and mold it into my own. Jem managed to snap me out of it, hitting me in the face with a pool noodle. I was half aware of him sitting on the edge of the pool, waving his hand in my face. Wake up, stupid head. He splashed me, and this time I did feel it. I blinked. Jem's voice bled into me, slamming into my skull. I blinked again, aware that I was shivering, my pajamas glued to me. Just like that, her light was gone. I tried to tell him, but the words were suffocated in my throat. I pointed at the sky, except the moon was already eclipsed by a cloud. I wanted to stay in the pool. I wanted to feel that light bathing my face again, the warmth of the water lapping around my waist. Mom gently dragged me out of the shallows and carried me back to bed. She told me I was just dreaming, cradling me in her arms, scrubbing my face with a towel. Still though, as soon as she left the room, I crawled out of bed and stood on my tiptoes to pull open the curtains, letting the moon's light seep into our bedroom. When I was a little older and more self-aware, I asked mom what that was sleepwalking. She replied, I thought it was sleepwalking, until the exact same thing happened to my brother and sister. Mom's birthday fell on a full moon, and at the time, the three of us were still in elementary school. I was eight, so I spent most of the afternoon sitting with my legs dangling in the pool watching Mom's friends drinking cocktails. Lena, my sister, liked to show off, and Mom's party was the perfect time to remind all of Mom's friends how cute she was. I watched my sister pretend she too was an adult insisting her juice box was an alcoholic beverage, prancing around in one of mom's dresses. The adults were impressed, telling my sister to do a twirl. Mom immediately freaked out, especially when Lena almost tripped into the pool wearing her high heels. My sister was put on a timeout for the rest of the day. Occasionally, I would peer over to where Lena sat on a deck chair, pouting under one of mom's straw hats, an iPad on her lap. Jem stayed unproblematic in the pool, lounging on a floaty playing Pokemon. When the sun went down, I expected the party to end. But mom was a little too drunk to remember she had small children, and those small children were tired. Mom locked the front gate to keep her friends from aimlessly wandering into the house, and the sliding glass doors leading inside required a code. Lena attempted to get mom's attention, but she was too far gone, enveloped in conversation with her equally intoxicated friends. When we tried to get her to open the door, she told us to go have fun and loosen up. Mom cranked up the music, her embarrassing dance moves making me wince. Go have fun, she told us, offering us empty juice boxes. Mom picked Jem up and spun him around so fast, his cheeks turned sickly green. Mommy's being stupid, he grumbled. Meanwhile, I really needed to go to the bathroom. I did try to have fun. After all, mom rarely let us stay up past bedtime, and it was way past our usual curfew. I should have been excited. Instead, I was snoozing on the side of the pool, trying to keep my eyes open. There was something wrong with the people at the party, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I noticed it when the sun disappeared and the sky turned darker, sunset bleeding into oblivion above us. It was when all light disappeared. Did I start to notice mom's friends were missing something. I inclined my head, narrowing my eyes. I watched a man dive into the pool. It's not like they were missing limbs, but something was missing. The latest cannonball into the pool caught me off guard, splashing me with water and snapping me out of it. When I lifted my head to shout at the man for ruining my dress, a semicircle of silver illuminated the water, and once my gaze found it, I was trapped, unable to move, to breathe. Just like that night standing in my pool, that sensation was back. The suffocating feeling of time stopping around me, the party ambiance dulled to a low murmur in my head. Someone else jumped into the pool, warm water hitting me in the face, but I barely felt it. I remember slowly tipping my head back, that silvery light seeping into my bones. It spoke to me in gentle murmurs, telling me to open my eyes when I squeezed them shut. When I did, a perfect moon illuminated the sky, and now that I was looking at it, I couldn't stop. I remember it was in perfect detail, so clear that I could see every crater. I was staring at the moon, and somehow, she was staring back. 
Across the pool, my brother caught stray moonlight sparkling on the surface of the water. Like me, he was entranced by it. It moved like a physical thing, dancing across fluorescent blue. The light found the party guests, illuminating their eyes, bleeding into pupils. It was looking for something, hitting every reflective surface. When the light settled on a snoozing Lena who immediately sat up, her wide eyes blinking up at the sky, I remember something sickly rising into my throat. It was like trying to unstick myself from quicksand. Sound hit me in a wave, laughter, music. When someone's hand found my shoulder, my body jerked and I twisted around. There was a man standing behind me. He was speaking but I couldn't hear what he was saying. Instead I found myself staring at him dazedly. Bathed in the pool lights, this man looked normal at first glance. But when I was peering closer, carving into him with my eyes, it hit me what was wrong with mom's friends. They didn't have shadows. Hannah. The man shook me gently. Sweetie, you should tell your mommy to stop drinking. He laughed. I blinked three times to get that growing circle of silver light out of my eyes. But it was stuck, initially a semicircle, slowly reaching totality. I stood up, and so did the others. Once again, I couldn't move. I was suffocating in that pooling silver light, what felt like ice-cold chains snaking around me. She whispered to me, a haunting melody with no language. It held me for so long, stealing away my breath, my words, before abruptly letting me go. Above me, the moon had slipped behind a cloud. Jem snapped out of it, almost tumbling in the pool. Lena rubbed her eyes, blinking rapidly. For a disorienting moment, part of me wanted the light back. Studying the pool for slithers of silver, I imagined myself enveloped in the water once again. Lena slid off her deck chair, her gaze still skating the sky. Jem was suddenly way too talkative with guests. Jem had been purposely avoiding the party goers all day, shoving away people who called him adorable and tried to ruffle his hair. So, when my brother strode directly over to one of mom's friends, I followed him. The stink of booze made me nauseous. Before she had too many drinks, mom banned and us from crossing the pool into what she called the adult side. We had to stay on the kid's side. The adults towered over me as I pushed my way towards my brother, who looked way too comfortable to be standing on the adult side. Jem was tugging at mom's friend's ugly dress. I heard mom laughing at her with her inner circle earlier. When Jem stepped in front of the woman, she immediately ruffled his hair. Mom's friend didn't have a shadow either. Jem Jem. Her bird-like squawk caught me off guard. Mom's friend had been calling him Jem Jem since we were in diapers. I knew my brother had a visceral reaction when she used that nickname. He hit her in the face with a rubber duck a year prior, but I don't think mom's friend had gotten the hint. Aw, oh, Jemmy, aren't you just the cutest? Jem nodded, smiling instead of scowling and storming off. It wasn't until I was getting closer to them, playing cloak and dagger behind the party goers, did I notice the tiniest slither of silver alive in my brother's eyes, seeping into his pupils. His smile was making me feel queasy. Unlike you, Jem said pointedly, maintaining a grin. I heard my mommy say you look like an ugly flamingo. Mom's friend looked taken aback. I'm sorry, what did you just say? Jem's smile widened. You heard me, he said louder. I said, you look like an ugly flamingo, and my mommy wants you to leave. She says you smell of sweat, and your husband is cheating on you with your best friend. Now, he had the attention of the rest of the party, including our mother who had sobered up enough to drag him back, choking out apologies. Jem, what is wrong with you? Say sorry to Mina. But it's the truth game, Jem whined. I'm just telling her what you told them. Mom turned several shades of white. Jem. My brother shook his head, his gaze glued to the sky. The light was glowing brighter in his eyes. He wasn't blinking. I'm not sorry, Jem said. Because you said it, Mom. He giggled and Mom stumbled back, like she was scared of him. You told all your friends that Mina is a gross, stinky bitch, and she looks like a flamingo. Mom's mouth dropped open. Jem Bolivia. Where did you learn that word? You, Mom, Jem said. Don't you remember calling Mina that bad word? Mina's expression twisted. Oh, did she? What else did she say, Jem Jem? My brother's smile terrified me, his eyes awash in white light. Well, before he could speak, Mom gently rested her hand over his mouth, muffling what I guessed was a long list of insults. Mom's cheeks bloomed red. Ignore him, 
He's just playing a game, she hissed out, pressing pressure over my brother's mouth when Jem spoke louder. I heard a really bad word, and mom looked like she was going to throw him in the pool. Behind me, I could see Lena balancing on the diving board. My sister couldn't swim and was deathly scared of water, but she didn't look phased, her toes teetering over the edge. Lena had that same light in her eyes. Mommy, I pointed behind me. Lena's, sweetie, not now. Mom said firmly, cutting me off, her attention on her friend. Mina, I don't understand why he's acting like this. Mom forced a laugh. You've known my son since he was a baby. Jem is usually so well behaved. She shoved my brother. Aren't you Jem? You're going to say you're sorry for being rude. When Jem muffled another bad word under her hand, mom turned scarlet. Did you have a miscarriage, Mina? Jem asked innocently, speaking through mom's hand. I looked up at the sky for the moon, but the moon wasn't in the sky. She was dancing in my brother's eyes. Mommy says she's glad you lost your baby. She said you don't deserve to have a baby because you're an ugly, dumb bitch who leeches off her husband. The party goers let out a collective murmur. Mom let go of Jem. Her hands slipped from his waist, lips twisting in disgust like he was diseased. Without a word, Mina strode over to our mother and dumped her colorful drink over Mom's head, soaking both Mom and Jem. Mina stepped back, her dark eyes flicking to my brother. Do you want me to start playing the truth game about your mother, Jem Jem? That intrigued me. Jem only inclined his head. His voice sounded wrong, almost melodic. Maybe. Mina crouched in front of him, a scary smile on her face. Jem Jem. Do you know your birthday, Mina? Mom swiped orange cocktail from her face. Don't speak to my fucking child like that. Her eyes darkened. Stay out of my family's business. Mina didn't respond, grasping my brother's hands. Are you hungry, sweetheart? I bet you're really hungry, Jem nodded, and the woman's smile widened. She opened her mouth to speak, a sudden loud splash cutting the tension. Mom twisted around, her eyes wide. Lena, Lena had jumped into the pool. I don't remember much from that night, except Lena being dragged out of the water and Mina leaving with a cryptic smile. Jem complained the next morning, he didn't even remember what he said, and that just earned him another day of grounding. Mom chastised him for being rude, but my brother had zero idea what she was talking about. We never saw Mina again. Jem Jem was dead, at least. As we grew older, however, the full moon's effect got worse. Lena developed a taste for raw meat. I caught her snacking on raw bacon. When I questioned what she was doing, my sister turned away from me, walking back upstairs in a daze. She had zero recollection the next day, vomiting her insides down the toilet. Jem became obsessed with water. When I say obsessed, I mean obsessed. His 13th birthday party happened to be a pool party, and once the sun went down, he refused to get out of the pool. When two of his friends dragged him out, he dived in the neighbor's pool insisting he wanted to stay in there forever. Luckily, Mr. and Mrs. Croft were on vacation, but Jem was still arrested for trespassing. The next morning, my brother was soaking, shivering in the sheriff's office, a towel wrapped around him, claiming to have zero idea why he was in trouble. The sheriff let him off with a warning. When he was 15 years old, he poured an entire water cooler over his head in front of his girlfriend and then confessed to having fantasies about his English teacher. She called the cops, also filming it, because what said I love you like recording your boyfriend's mental breakdown. The video which went viral across town, painting my brother as a psycho. He did look like one, admittedly. When Jem tried to tell her it was the moon, she sent the screenshots to half of the school, humiliating him further. Jem was arrested. Again, the cops found him in another stranger's pool the following full moon. This time two men in black wanted to speak to him. Lena dragged him out of there before they could start asking questions. I was a mixture of Lena and Jem. I found a raw chicken bone in my bed and a half-eaten pigeon. During my school's lock-in, I came out to my entire freshman class before almost waterboarding myself in the drinking fountain. I was drawn to water, but it was in a different way. While Jem and Lena wanted to stay enveloped in it, my polluted mind used it to look for her. She never dragged me into water like them. I was always left on the edge, my toes teetering so close like she was teasing water over land. It was when we were 17 when the moon started to really fuck with us. The older we were getting, her spell was getting stronger. By our late teenagehood, we were fully aware of our sensitivity. I looked it up, but all I could 
find was a phenomenon called the Transylvania Effect, a series of instances of the moon influencing human behavior. There were a series of Reddit posts a few years ago detailing someone afflicted, but I can't read them. Mom had this stupid child lock on the internet, so certain Reddit posts were blocked. Needless to say, we were fighting for our lives against a force completely out of our control. Harvest moons were particularly brutal. Jem taped up his bedroom windows and zipped himself up in a sleeping bag, and I wore a paper bag on my head the whole night, hiding under my sheets. Mom works nights, so she didn't notice our behavior. If she did, we would already be in a white room. When totality hit one again, we were ready. Jem turned off the water supply in the house, and I trashed all of the raw meat. To stop us playing the truth game, I threw our phones into the swimming pool. Jem locked all doors and windows. Lena, however, thought both of us were being ridiculous and happily stepped out into a moonlit night to grab candy from the store. We found her an hour later. Lena was on her knees on the kitchen floor. I started toward her, only for Jem to violently drag me back. When I shot him a look, he pointed to the window spilling pure moonlight. She was waiting for us. Lena, I whispered, and the girl's body jerked. She inclined her head, moonlit eyes vacant, spitting out a chewed up bone. I could almost mistake it for territorial. Jem let out a hiss next to me. Is, is that Pepper? Pepper was our neighbor's cat. Lena was smitten with the tabby, insisting on feeding him every time he plodded through the door. I recognized the lump of orange fur, a grisly trail of scarlet smearing pristine tiles. I still remember the crunch of bones between her teeth, my sister's lips smeared scarlet. Like an animal, a predator, she clung onto the carcass, scooping entrails into her mouth. When I whispered her name again, the crunching stopped. Lena lifted her head slowly. Get back, Jem gritted out, yanking me into the shadow. I shoved him away, instead taking a step forward. It only took one single glance. Moonlight. All I could see was moonlight. Like a living thing, it was teasing us, waiting for us to step in it or accidentally catch its eerie glow. It was in Lena's eyes, in her toothy grin, reflecting in thick rivulets of red pooling down her chin. When I moved closer, the light bled further into the room, a growing semicircle illuminating my sister. Jem stumbled back, but she followed, backing him into the wall. It was impossible to avoid. Impossible to run away from, drowning the room. In the corner of my eye, she found Jem's eyes, bathing his face. I blinked slowly, and my body was no longer mine. Caught in light so bright, and yet so beautiful, I wanted to touch it. I was suddenly far too aware of the swimming pool outside, and how much she loved water. How much I loved water. The last thing I remembered was dropping to my knees in front of Lena. The next morning, I woke up outside, face down in my mother's flower garden. Lena was nowhere to be seen, and Jem was upside down on a floaty in the pool. I could pretend it was a party, but I was shaking, my breaths coming out in sharp pants. Not enough oxygen was in the air. When I caught my reflection in the bathroom, through mirror, the remnants of the neighbor's cat stained my lips and teeth in grisly scarlet. Half of Pepper's head was buried under my pillow like I'd hidden it from the others. That was when I attempted to sign myself into a psych ward. The other two distanced themselves after that incident. Jem locked himself in his room, and Lena started sleeping at her boyfriend's house. When I texted them about the full moon and that we had to protect ourselves, I was left on red. Jem acted like it never happened, falling in with a group of high school dropouts, and Lena told me to grow up. In her words, it was just our imagination. Stop talking like that. You sound crazy. The two of them wanted to get as far away from our family as possible. Jem moved halfway across the country and Lena studied abroad. It's not like I blamed them. Our grandma was refusing to die and the moon turned us into psychos. Still, I was alone. I started college and kept to myself. Full moon nights consisted of me locking myself in a campus bathroom stall and tying my hands together, which actually worked. What I did notice was outside of my mom's inner circle, everyone else had a shadow. The moon's spell weakened significantly. I didn't know if I was because I was aging, but after a year away from my siblings and my hometown, the moon stopped fucking with me. Well, she gave me headaches, but that was it. Via text, the other two experienced the exact same. I hypothesized that the three of us being apart had weakened her. I didn't see any of my siblings for two whole years. Until mom's call, I almost refused. 
but Grammy was special to me. She was the first person I felt comfortable pouring my heart out to. However, the three of us together on a full moon was a recipe for disaster. You didn't call, you know? Jem's voice brought me out of my thoughts. I checked the sky. According to the research I obsessively checked on my phone, the moon would reach totality at 8.01. Over the years, I had become convinced our town was a whole other level of weird. Regardless of the rest of the world, the moon rises whenever she likes here, so we had to be careful. It was a guessing game. Neither did you. I didn't realize how pissed I was until my words came out like venom. Well, yeah, Jem laughed shakily. I admit, I wanted to distance myself. I shoved past him, keeping my eyes on the ground. You wanted to distance yourself by moving halfway across the country and ignoring my calls. You could have been dead. Twisting around, I was suddenly fuming. You could have fucking drowned yourself. His laugh was obnoxious. That was one time. The moon's chill with me now. You still left us. Jem came to an abrupt stop. I'm sorry, what the fuck did you expect me to do, Hannah? He sputtered out a laugh. Did you want me to stay so I could watch my sister chow down on another cat? I didn't turn around, something warm slithering up my throat. I still couldn't get that image out of my head. Lena with empty eyes and a grinning mouth, glistening entrails still clinging to her teeth. Jem sniffled. I really hoped he wasn't crying, because I sucked with empathy. I needed to get away, he whispered. I thought I was losing my fucking mind. And yet you left your sisters. I didn't know what else to do. We reached the clearing, and there it was across the road. Grandma's house. Jem looked like he was going to argue, his expression softening, a small smile curving on his lips. His shoulders relaxed, and the tension between us dissolved. The bitterness I'd been struggling to swallow down faded, and I was just happy to see my brother again. I realized the feeling was mutual when Jem shoved me. I shoved him back, the two of us racing to the gate. It was always a race to grandma's house. I was greeted to wildflowers up to my knees, the familiar smell of lavender tickling my nose. I had a vague memory of pressing my face into the walls, inhaling peppermint and chocolate. Grammy told us she built the house herself a long time ago, especially for children. This time it was me who noticed the trail of crumbs leading to grandma's front door. Breadcrumbs. I knocked twice, checking my phone. 7.30. I knocked again, slightly more panicked. Food poisoning. I blurted out. Jem snorted. What? I knocked again, gritting my teeth. The moon wasn't even out yet, and I already felt suffocated by her. Jem's presence had turned us into a beacon. We have food poisoning, I said, or the stomach flu. Just say you feel sick. I've texted Lena. Jem nodded. And, did she reply? Nope. I was about to knock again, jumping up and down on the heels of my feet when the door opened. Ah, my grandchildren made it. Whatever I was going to say was suddenly stuck at the back of my throat. Grammy was standing in front of us, smiling widely. I was aware of voices behind her, a congregation of people gathered in her house. I could hear mom's voice, smell the thick aroma of meat stew drifting through the door. I was partially aware of a phantom swarm of bugs wriggling down my spine, my mind thrown off kilter. Grandma, I managed to choke out. Hi. The woman in place of our Grammy was barely 40 years old. Beautiful. Her hair was liquid gold, every wrinkle on her face, every flaw, gone. The last time I saw her, my Grammy was a hollow shell that could barely speak. Still, I could see my grandma in her sweet smile and kind eyes. It was her, but it was like Grammy's younger self had stepped out of a photo. I took a step back, my body already wanting to run. There was no way this woman was my hundred and sixteen year old grandma. Mom's exact words were that we were going to say goodbye. Drawing in a breath, I tried to smile, tried to greet this imposter, while my brother stood almost trance-like. He whipped off his glasses, eyes wide, mouth hanging open. Grammy was supposed to be dying, supposed to be glued to her chair, hollowed out eyes struggling to take me in. Next to me, Jem let out a shuddery breath. What the fuck? I elbowed him, forcing my lips into a smile. Maybe we were mistaken, I thought dizzily. Maybe this woman was a friend of Grammy's. When she hugged us both, however, squeezing us to her chest, that thought went out the window. You're both so big, she chuckled. Let me look at you. Grammy cradled my face, her fingernails scraping my cheek. 
Hannah, you have your mother's eyes. Grammy ruffled Jem's hair. Look at you, Jem. So handsome. I bet you're breaking hearts. Yeah. Jem stepped back, maintaining his forced smile. Grammy, you look great. He laughed, and I nudged him to shut up. Like, 50 years younger, with a wide smile that didn't say anything, she ushered us inside, where we spent the next 10 minutes being introduced to every single one of her friends, all of whom were actually old. I noticed something was off about each of them, though I couldn't put a finger on what it was. When Jem was being prodded by Grammy's friends with wandering hands, I escaped to the kitchen where mom was cooking dinner. Hannah, you made it. Mom didn't turn around. Can you set the table? We'll be having guests before we eat dinner. Sure. I managed to choke out. Mom, they're special guests, Hannah, she hummed. I'm excited for you to meet them. I'm making their favorite dish. Yeah, it smells good, I said dismissively, leaning against the door. Mom, am I going fucking crazy, or is Grammy, like 50 years younger? Mom turned and hugged me, her gaze automatically snapping to my stomach. You're not eating properly. Mom, that's not the issue here, I hissed. What happened to Grandma? She went back to stirring stew. Set the table. Our guests will be arriving soon. Mom was going to be zero help. When I abandoned her, I bumped into Jem. His jacket hung off of one shoulder, a lipstick kiss smudged on his left cheek. They keep saying I look good enough to eat. Old people were adorable. Well, he mouthed, scrubbing at his face. I just shook my head. I'm going to the bathroom. You set the table for dinner. Jem frowned. Wait, why me? I nodded to the barrage of old people. You have fans. Halfway up the stairs, I noticed something on the carpet. A single crumb, chocolate cake. Again, further up, there was more. A whole trail leading down the upstairs hallway. Curious, I followed it where it came to a stop outside grandma's bedroom door. Hannah, mom shouted from downstairs when my hand was inching toward the handle. Dinner is ready. Hannah, the muffled voice from behind the door startled me. Lena, Hannah, help me. The door was open. When I pushed through, my gaze first found the ground. Pooling scarlet staining cream carpet. Something in my mind seemed to snap, come apart, unraveling me completely. There was chocolate cake and candy everywhere, splattering the walls, streams of scarlet staining every surface. I saw my sister's dress, a pink gown she had gushed about days earlier over text. But that was it. There was just Lena's dress, Lena's torso, half of her arm chained to the wall, the other half chewed off. I could see where chunks of her had been hacked off, the fat off of her legs, half of her fingers and toes. Next to her was my brother's suit jacket crumpled in a heap. I glimpsed what looked like Jem's arm, mangled down to the bone, still attached to the wall, but... Jem was downstairs. When I saw my own head half shoved under the bed, my skull gnawed into the world around me started to crumble. Hannah, the headless torso with my sister's voice wailed. Hannah, make it stop. I could see my sister's hands scooping up chocolate frosting, cramming it where her mouth should have been. I took a step back. Something warm splattered the front of my shirt, dripping down my chin. I'd barfed over myself, but I barely noticed. I watched my brother's severed hand writhing, like it was still attached to a body, still wanting to gorge itself on treats. When I slammed the door on Lena, her disembodied cry was still rattling in my skull. I can't stop eating. I thought about my actions very carefully. Slowly, I made my way back downstairs. Mom was serving dinner and Grandma was in the kitchen, crouched in front of the oven. The mincemeat on the stove was thick, bubbling into a paste. Lena stew. I took the sharpest knife I could find and aimed to stab my grandma in the neck. Then I planned to slit my mother's throat and run. My own family had cannibalized whatever the fuck was in that room. I couldn't think, couldn't breathe, blinded by intense, brutal red. What I wasn't planning on was Jem coming up behind me. From the sickly glow in his cheeks, he had found Lena too. So, with one brutal kick, my brother shoved our grandma into the oven. We had always joked as kids that one of us could fit in there. Get out. Jem managed to hiss. Now, when he straightened up, I knew what his plan was. Run. Instead, however, his gaze found the reflection of my knife where an all too familiar light bled through the window. Time seemed to stop, and in that moment, I barely comprehended my brother snatching the knife from my hands. His eyes were already filled with her, his expression relaxing, softening, before he plunged the blade into his throat. 
In the time it took for my brother to hit the ground, intense red stemming around him, my mother was already wrapping her arms around me, her lips latched to my ear. Hannah, didn't I tell you we had guests? Mom nodded to Jem. Fresh is always better. She hummed to several people crowding around her. I did prepare a stew for our guests, but they arrived just in time for the starter and main course. When I let out a shriek, her hand slammed over my mouth. Skin him. The king does not like bones. Grandma had recovered, straightening up. The Bolivia House residents must feast, she said. Skin and gut the boy. Jem was dragged away by his feet, a scarlet smear following him. Grandma's words rattled in my head. Meat. Mom matched me out into the hallway, lit up in orange candlelight. The crowd of strangers parted for us, and I was forced to my knees in front of four looming figures. Mom forced my head down in prayer. Hannah, you are so lucky to not just be part of them, but also feed them. They are so hungry. Her voice broke out into a sob, a hysterical cry. She took our outlines, our terrestrial shackles, and we are so grateful for her mercy. We will feed our kings and queens with the blessed flesh they birthed. Mom had lost her fucking mind. I expected the four guests to be gods with the way she was acting, but looking up at them, risking a glance, I was face to face with three college kids, mid to late 20s, two guys, and two girls. I think they used to be human, now shells of humans, shaped and molded into something else entirely. These people were not gods, their bodies and minds shaped and used as terrestrial hosts for gods. The crowns of bone forced onto their heads were brutal, old and new red staining their skin. But it was their eyes I was drawn to, filled, suffocated, drowned in blood-stained moonlight. It writhed under their skin, polluted in their blood. Underneath crowns of human bone, one of the guys had freckles. The blonde girl had flowers in her hair, laugh lines on her face. I think they used to be like us. Hannah, don't be rude. Do you know how long they have waited to see you? I didn't move, paralyzed to the spot. One of the girls, a brunette, offered her hand. Hannah, mom snapped, shake your goddess's hand. With not much choice, I obliged, trembling. I saw a flash of something, moonlight stained with blood pooling across a concrete floor, a skylight, and the same guy in front of me. He was their king drenched in red, half of a human skull sitting comfortably on reddish curls. His smile was inhuman, a god suffocating a human boy's soul. Unnatural eyes I could have sworn were filled with static. That is who I saw. In her memory, this king was a frightened college kid, lips curved into a scowl. You knocked us out and tied us up in our basement. His voice echoed in the woman's memories. I think that counts as hurting. Another memory hit, and I sensed the woman's fingers tightening around mine. She was clinging to me, her nails stabbing into my flesh. What if we don't come back this time? His voice was soft. I saw human eyes filled with light, still clinging on. This man held a hatred, a disdain for her she didn't understand. You didn't come back, you left me. Her voice was faded, almost completely drowned out by that same melody. When she snatched her hand back I blinked rapidly, the memory dissolving. The woman was staring at me, her lips curled into what might have been a cry. I recognized longing in her expression, pain. These four gods didn't have shadows either. I wanted to talk to them. I want to ask them why before my mother slit my throat in front of them. I don't remember dying, and yet I can feel the blade slicing into my skin. I remember their teeth piercing my flesh, their fingers like claws ripping me open. But I didn't die. I was spat out before oblivion could take me. When I woke up, up, my body was made of static, my fingers etched from pins and needles. I was curled up in grandma's attic. Next to me was Lena, sitting with her knees to her chest. Her eyes were wide, vacant. Jem was cross-legged, a box in front of him. I noticed he was still missing a leg, the shadow of it slowly stitching itself back into reality. There were flowers in the attic, dead and drooping, not made of static, pins and needles stitching them together. Oh, you're awake. Jem threw a phone at me. Calls don't work. Neither do texts. But it has the internet. Jem. He didn't look at me, his hands shaking. Yeah, I know. He held up a sheet of paper and I squinted at it. It's our birth certificates, Jem said. According to this, we weren't born 21 years ago. He thrust the document in my face. We were born six months ago. I followed his pointer finger. That psycho bitch isn't our mother either, Jem prodded at a name that had been scratched out. 
That is our mother. There's so much going through my head right now. I died. I came back to life. Is that why I also exist in that room? Am I a never-ending meat supply? You have to help us. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am or what I am. Most importantly, I have no idea who or what brought us into this world. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel and I look forward to making more content for everyone.